everything else is normal. MRI is reported as hematoma on the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh, large one, almost 21 centimeters by 13 centimeters. The drainage is done by a general surgeon. No tissue sent for culture and histopathology. Two weeks after surgery, he develops very severe pain. Counts go up. There is a discharge from operative site. Pain increases. And the surgeon feels that this is infected hematoma. So he does a CT angiography. Again, it is reported as subacute anterior compartment hematoma. He does redebridement. The cultures come acinetobacter and he starts appropriate antibiotics, but patient is very, very uncomfortable. And in spite of all the treatment, he is toxic. There's a gas in the muscles and therefore the general surgeon, sorry, orthopedic surgeon feels that this is gas gangrene. Now, all of you have very clearly said that this is most unlikely to be gas gangrene. Absolutely right. This is most unlikely to be gas gangrene. So what was our thought process? Whether it was infected or not? Yes, obviously infected, raised counts, raised GSR, parallel discharge. So no, no two ways, no discussion about whether it is infected or not. It was infected. Is it gas gangrene or not? No, all of you have said that it runs a more fulminant course. Here, the symptoms were going on for more than a month and there are many gas forming organisms. So no way it is going to be gas gangrene. Uh, I've just put these two photographs. That's the gas gangrene. Generally, it is diffuse and extensive. While here, it was a localized area plus X-ray also shows that there's a skin defect. So from there, gas can easily enter. So now, think like an investigating officer, investigating or addressing a mishap. What is happening? Number one, yes, the MRI and CT do show a hematoma. It also shows a capsule to the hematoma. So whether it can be something else. This is a thought that you have to entertain before starting theater. Now, the thought process, the infection has to be brought under process. Whatever it is, I have to bring down the infection or load. So considering the working diagnosis of infected hematoma, since there seems to be an encapsulated mass, I thought I must excise it completely because just scraping that part is not going to be helpful. Unless I try and excise it completely, it is not going to settle. So an infected hematoma with a good capsule, you need to excise completely. Now, since the other thing was at the back of our mind, we said we must have a frozen section. But what are our other challenges? We have a deranged coag profile. So obviously, we must have blood ready. We must have hematologist opinion. And we must have platelets and FFP, fresh frozen plasma. All of that has to be in theater. Sample has to be sent for culture or histopathology, something which we have been stressing again and again. What is sent for culture must be sent for histopathology. The challenge in the, uh, in, as far as incision is concerned, uh, I think uh, this point also was stressed by uh, people who have responded that the incision is very small, very, very small. You need to increase the incision significantly. Another important thing is the drain is at right angles to the incision. So the entire middle tract also gets infected. So unfortunately, you will have to have an incision like this. Whole thing. Otherwise, you will not be able to excise the entire infected granulation tissue. Now, uh, someone had said that we will do embolization. Yes, embolization is a very good process for this. However, you don't have time at hand. Here you can see that it is generally performed within a few days before surgery. So you wait for two, three, four days before doing surgery. Here, we could not wait because patient was toxic. So what did we do? We thought we really prepared OT. We had 
uh, I insisted that Dr. Menon is around. We had a senior anesthetist. We had packed cells. We had platelets. We had frozen plasma. We had this ferric ceruleum, which is quite useful for controlling, controlling the uh, excessive oozing. And we had frozen section. We also kept, now this is that SEP guard, which is a hemostatic antiseptic solution. And we had argon cotton. So moment I attempted this resection, I realized that number one, it is stuck on the medial side. And number two, this was something not right. The appearance was not right. This does not appear like a hematoma and confirmed our thinking that we could be dealing with something else. So since we had kept frozen section ready, fortunately, we had kept frozen section ready. At this stage only, before I excised everything, I sent it for frozen section and out came report. Unfortunately for the patient, it was a spindle cell neoplasm. So we had a shock of our life that it has been going on for some time and here I am infected patient, toxic patient. The mass is really not very easily excisable. It, I could separate it from all sides except the medial side. So what do I do? Fortunately, Dr. Manish Agarwal, who, was, who is our oncosurgeon, uh, I talked to him. He said, don't middle on the medial side. Don't do anything. Excise whatever you can excise. Just cut it off. Don't dissect on the medial side. Pack and come out. Don't bother. Save the life and then we will address what is to be done. So histopathology was undifferentiated, pleomorphic spindle cell sarcoma. We asked Dr. Manish Agarwal to take over. So he repeated the MRI. You can see there is a still some mass left on the medial side. PET was done, which showed the thigh lesion as well as metastasis in the lungs, unfortunately. The culture grew enterobacter, so cholestin and ciproflox was started. Now what do we do? So Dr. Manish Agarwal said, let's debride again. So we debrided again. This was a large cavity, but we try and took out as much as possible and then put VAC. This was will reduce the size of the wound and will get the skin edges together. And he said, then we will excise everything. So this was a wide resection done by Dr. Manish Agarwal four days later. You can see that's a 12 inches scale and that's a kind of excision of the skin and tissue that was done. And here you will see that we have not removed the sponge. The sponge is still there. And then we just excised it all around the sponge. This is the wound. You can see quite clean wound, post vac, partially closed. And here Dr. Modi did the split thickness graft. This is seven months after presentation. He is undergoing chemotherapy for pulmonary lesions. That time there was no evidence of infection. Reasonably walking, comfortably walking, has a decent range of knee movement. So take home, friends. Beware of an entity called chronic hematoma. Chronic infected hematoma is a very dangerous title. Whenever you do a biopsy, send it for both histopathology as well as culture. If the general surgeon had sent it for histopathology on day one, things could have been different. When you are doing this or excising it, expose the entire tissue. Just percutaneous thing may not be helpful. Most important, be guided but not governed by radiology. Whenever in doubt, get a second opinion. So what I am trying to say, think like a crime branch officer while dealing with cases of osteoarticular infection. This is a crime committed. This is a mishap that has happened. Now you are an investigating officer. Think of everything else. Friends, unfortunately, there's a tragic end to this story because we lost him of metastasis. So may God rest his soul in peace. Okay, now while I'm... Dr. Aditya, are you ready with your presentation? 
Yes, sir. Should I first uh, take up the MRI images of this case? Yes, yes, yes. Or, take yeah. up the MRI images. You have that presentation of MRI? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll stop sharing. Meanwhile, we will entertain any questions. Are there any questions they can people can unmute and ask questions? I, I can I say something? Yes, please. Yes. The one ENT surgeon referred me a patient uh, post mastoidectomy wound breakdown. We sent that tissue for biopsy, it came cox. We started him on anti cox and the wound healed by itself. So, what you are saying is that it's necessary to send biopsy and culture for all, for all wounds that suddenly behave funnily. Correct, correct, correct. Absolutely right. So there is no point in just sending for one thing. Yes, Aditya. Aditya. Oh, yes, sir. I'll go ahead. So like sir has explained in this case, sir, we must keep differential diagnosis in mind whenever dealing with an expanding non-traumatic mass, which looks like a hematoma. It could be an aneurysm. It could be a chronic expanding hematoma, which is an entity in itself. Uh, it could be bleeding diastasis or a soft tissue sarcoma like in this case. What we must understand, apart from the clinical radiological, I mean, the CT angio and clinical picture is the MRI. Uh, like we had revised in the previous sessions, we must look at T1, T2 post-contrast images. The T1 image would show blood to be bright. So if it's full of bright image on T1, it could very well be a hematoma or an AV malformation. Anything that's dark would be muscle. In a T2 image, bright means necrotic muscle, necrotic tissue. Like we've seen last time, anything abnormal like a pus or something would be bright or hyper intense on T2. Anything that's dark would be blood. So blood would be bright on T1 and dark on T2. And in post contrast, any soft tissue which has blood would enhance. Any necrotic area which does not have blood obviously would not enhance and would be hypo. So you would get a mixed image. So in an acute hematoma, because it's blood, you would get a hyper intense or bright signal on T1 and a dark image on T2. In a chronic hematoma, because there will be resolving uh, hematoma, there would be nothing fresh. There would be clots. It would be dark on T1 and T2. Whereas a sarcoma, which is solid component, which has blood supply, would be dark on T1 and bright on T2. And contrast would give heterogeneous enhancement, which would suggest that area areas of necrosis, which are avascular. So that's, in short, the MRI images, MRI uh, findings of hematoma versus sarcoma. So whenever in doubt, or even if when you are not in doubt, make it a habit to meet your imaging consultants, go to MRI department, go to CT scan department, discuss clinical, that way both of you will learn. And mistakes like this, are not likely to happen. If you discuss right in the beginning that this is something a little odd, why will you just revise your diagnosis or at least review your images, then things like this generally don't happen. And, and adding to that, sir, uh, there is a website called Radiopedia, R-A-D-I-O, like Wikipedia, it's called Radiopedia. It's a website even radiologists refer to. It gives very simple explanation as to how muscle blood would look on T1, T2 and post contrast. Radiopedia is an extremely good website, which even I have referred to in making these slides. A lot of things are self explanatory Thank you. Thank you. So, Aditya, uh, we go to the next case that we had discussed. We have all gone through the, these images. Patient presented with infective arthritis, loss of joint space, and all this started post arthrography. So, as discussed on the group, as well as discussed in those two articles, that any infection after any penetrating trauma, if the histopathology is tuberculosis or suggestive of TB, think of non tubercle mycobacteria. Now, what are non-tubercle mycobacteria? All the mycobacteria, which are not mycobacterium tuberculosis complex or mycobacterium lepri are non-tubercle mycobacteria. 
They could be fast growing, they could be slow growing. That we discussed a case of slow growing mycobacteria where at least in India, it is not possible to do a culture sensitivity studies. That disc is not available in India. So here he is, one month post arthrogram, he became very uncomfortable. Smear was positive for A, B. Histopathology was suggestive for tuberculosis. And then with four drug AKT, he had not settled. So the first thing that came to our mind was this is very, very likely to be a atypical mycobacterial or non-mycobacterial -tuber, non tubercular infection, NTM. So based on this, now how do we address this? Whatever may be the infection, it has almost destroyed the joint space and also involved the head. So it is very unlikely that whatever may be the pathology, you'll be able to salvage this. So we decided to do an excision arthroplasty and a radical, radical debridement. So here you can see there's a large defect in the head, which was actually, what we did was first, since he had a flexion deformity, we went by Smith-Peterson approach, dislocated the head anteriorly and realized that there was a large defect lot of pus inside and a big cavity inside the head. So we decided to go ahead with our plan of excision head and neck femur and inform the microbiologist that we are suspecting this. And within no time, within eight or 10 days, the culture came as rapidly growing non-tuberculous mycobacteria, that is mycobacterium chelonic. Now, see, this being tuberculosis or suggestive of tuberculosis, every patient feels that a pulmonologist should see. We also failed in 2004. So we referred him to a pulmonologist. Uh, there was, especially in, at least in 2004, there were no good guidelines for, for, suggestion, uh, for treatment of this. Even today, there are not fixed guidelines, but we will discuss that later. So he started her on amic acid 750 IV three times a week, clarithromycin and linezolid. Despite this, the fulminant infection did not resolve. And at three months, he came back with a sinus, which had continued in spite of our repeated debridement. He, the infection had just not settled. That was the time when an infectious disease specialist was called in. So he said, Increase the dose and add something. So increase the dose of amikacin one gram per day for one month. And instead of three times a week, he made it five times a week after one month. Also, in addition to clarithro and linezolid, he added clofizamine. And that was continued for seven months. He also said that your debridement has to be aggressive. So he said, when I'm starting medication, I want a very clean wound. So we explored, you can see we have excised thoroughly and we have added antibiotic beads, tobramycin beads. Wound healed very well. This is him at two years post-completion, no medication, no signs of infection, excellent range of movement. He was walking with a stick with Trendlenburg gait and since he was middle age, he insisted on a TKR and uh, this is him at about seven months. Now it's almost three, four years and he is very, very comfortable. So remember these antimicrobial agents, the number of agents suggested. Problem is everybody says that multi-drug treatment is needed. But even in literature, what should be the combination? What should be the total duration? What should be the duration of individual drugs? And for RGM or slow growing, is it same or different? So in general, for soft tissue infections, four months of treatment. For bony infection with rapidly growing, six months of treatment. For bony infection with slow growing, at least one year. People keep giving it for 20 months also. And lastly, these things are common in immunocompromised patients. So there, and in them, 
the duration is generally more varying from 12 to 14 months at least now please read this article very very useful article whenever you are in doubt whenever you are dealing with cox but following penetrating injury following an injection local steroids following uh, acupuncture then think of a typical mycobacteria read this article which has uh, a very extensive article and very recent 2021 and you will get good guidelines yeah any questions Yes, sir. May I ask you questions? Yes, Suranjan. Yeah. Before he comes to the question, why did he? Why does this patient have a arthrography oh, sorry, in the I, first I place? I was not. I was mute. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. Can I ask, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just I, to answer Dr. Thakur's question. Uh, he possibly had a liberal lesion. Possibly had a liberal lesion. And that is why his arthrogram was done. He I had mean, mild pain. Did not have very severe pain. But, uh, you know, he was of that type. I must know what is happening. What is happening to me? He oh. could move around. He could walk two kilometers at a, at a stretch. But he used to have mild pain. So, okay. he insisted on trying to find out the problem. And so, that is why uh, <clears throat> MR, uh, sorry, uh, arthrogram was done. Okay, very unfortunate complication of yes. uh, simple arthroscope. Yes, Suranjan. Yes, sir, I was mute. I didn't realize that. Uh, sir, the acetabulum looks very scary. How did you debride the acetabulum part? Taking out the head was okay, but then how much to go into the acetabulum and how to really debride that? That's one. The second is, sir, uh, the beads that you have given with uh, cholestin, I believe. Uh, cholestin comes... What, uh, what, what? I didn't get you. A tobramycin bead you have given. Yeah, tobramycin. tobramycin. Yes. tobramycin. Now, the point is uh, 20 grams of bone cement, and then we can add whatever you have to. But this one, you need to reduce the amount of bone cement. Then I find it difficult to understand that if, I using, if I'm using half of 20 grams, let's say 10 grams, I just want five beads to get in there. I had trouble in one of the patients while operating because their beads were much more than I wanted. But then I had already put the antibiotics, so I could not discard it. So how to you know reduce the? I mean, do you just proportionately give the solvent with the bone cement, or how do you really uh, come down with the amount of cement that you're using with the antibiotic? Uh, can I? Did I make my question clear, sir? I'll repeat. Uh, it you mean to say that you have added? appropriate antibiotics, say 5% or 10%. Right, I've done that. The prepared beads. But then now the cavity is much less or smaller than that. Correct. So instead of your 20 beads that you have prepared, you ah. can put only 10 beads. Correct. So proportionately the antibiotic dose or antibiotic uh, concentration decreases is what you are trying to say. Exactly. Right? So, so if I anticipate that, then I would use less amount of cement. So I won't use 20 grams. I would use 10 grams, half of the cement. So while mixing that half of the cement with the solvent, is it just an eyeballing that you just use half of the solvent and half of the cement? Or how really do you do it? So the concentration of antibiotic yeah. will decide two things. One yeah. is illusion of antibiotics locally. Correct. Less the dose, less is the illusion, of course. Obviously. You can't add anything more than 10% of that cement volume. Hmm. Because otherwise it would become very brittle yeah. and defeats the purpose because if it breaks, then you are in trouble. Hmm. So the concentration has to be maximum. 4 grams to 6 grams or maximum, maximum 6 grams for 40%, 40, 40 ml. Hmm. You can't go beyond that. Ideally about 4 to 6 grams. Number one. Number two, if the quantity is more, you put less number of beads. It doesn't matter. Hmm. Okay. But do not increase the concentration of local antibiotics. Right, sir. So, Dr. Menon, you will have, you have yes. something to add? So, Dr. Suraj, if you've opened a packet of 20 grams and I understand you want to use lesser because the cavity is less, 
there is no point dividing the cement. You can never use that remaining 10 grams again because it's unsterile. Mm-hmm. You can never use it in another patient. So mm-hmm. you might as well mix the appropriate amount of antibiotics for 20 grams. Start making the cement and then from that use how much ever cement you want. So then in that way, the concentration of antibiotic remains stable. The amount of cement reduces from 20 grams. So you might end up using 5 grams. But in that 5 grams, you're still using 10% antibiotic. So that would remain the same. So don't try to divide it into 10 grams and then eyeball in 10 grams how much antibiotic you're going to add. That that can never happen. Plus the liquid also, the liquid monomer would also That's what, the liquid monomer ratio will be very different. No, so, so make the whole packet and then from that use as much. The rest is going to be wasted. We can anyway, ideally we should never use the remaining 10 grams again for another. So the antibiotic also gets wasted because the antibiotic... It, it does, added. I mean, it, yeah. it does. So yeah, it does. That's fine. Right, that, that's a part of the same thing we were explaining in stimulant that although we've opened a packet of 5 cc we end up using sometimes only 2 2 and a half cc because the space is that much fair enough that's that's the part of the wastage yeah this is what i encountered in the last patient they operated upon so, so that yeah. was the question so the first part of the question is so the acetabulum how did you do the debris yes uh acetabulum was scary agree hmm. but we kept on debriving till See, the, especially here, the bleeding is significant. Hmm. Day one, doing a very aggressive debridement on the acetabular side does become a little difficult. So, what you need to do is scrape, keep it packed for some time, take it out, again scrape, keep it packed for some time. You know, you, you can't just keep scraping and scraping because they really bleed so much that you are unable to make out what is happening. Hmm. So, it has to be done in phases. Then you keep it packed for about, say, 10 minutes, relax and go back because by then the, the bleeding would become little less and you are able to make out the infected area. Number one, especially number two is whenever things like acetabulum are involved, we would go back again second time after about two or three days to find out the condition and scrape again. Right. It is really as you rightly put it, becomes very difficult to define what is infected and what is not infected on day one. It's... Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, a lot of arthroplasty surgeons use sequential size of reamers, especially in peripheral. So that is, if, if comfortable with reamers, start with the smallest and then increase one by one. So that way we are sure that once we get the fit, we are not going to penetrate beyond what is required. As well as ensuring sharpening. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so there was one question in the chat box from Dr. Aisha. What was the CBNAT? I think gene export result of the uh, hip patient, NTM patient. You would like to take that? I think the gene export was negative in that patient. Uh, no, I think this the... was 2004, where CBNAT was not commonly used. Okay. But having said this. It is a very, very important thing. If you, fee, you see AFB smear positive and gene expert negative, that means you are very, very likely to be dealing with a typical mycobacteria. The number of bacteria needed for smear are much more than that needed for gene expert. So, and number two, gene expert is specific for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So you have a smear positive. So that means the concentration of bugs is reasonably high. So if it is TB, your gene expert has to be positive. So you have a positive smear, but negative gene expert, that means 100% or 99% this is a typical mycobacteria or non tubercle mycobacteria and the second question to that is the role of anti tubercle therapy and cyanobacteria followed by skeletal traction can this lead to formation of fibrocartilage and reversal of acetabular lesion with AKT in ntm in the background of ntm yeah 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 so most important thing you must remember about ntm is Classic anti-TB drugs don't work, especially for rapidly growing mycobacteria. Many of them work for slow growing mycobacteria, but definitely not for rapidly growing mycobacteria. 
so do not in fact he was on akt for 3 day 3 months and he had deteriorated significantly so don't ever, ever think of giving anti tb drugs for non tubercle mycobacteria yes yeah so if there are no more no questions more. dr menon will you go to yes post arthroscopy infections of infection that's post arthroscopy infection the reason why we included this is arthroscopic procedures are becoming norm in today's day and age so infections after any surgery are going to increase as the volume of surgery increases so what we've trying to highlight is uh, we must be prepared for everything atypical whenever we're dealing with arthroscopic infection incisions bacteria and antibiotics so we'll go through a few cases which will stress upon why we are saying atypical uh, so this is a 30 year old male with uh, one year post operative arthroscopic acl reconstruction came with fever severe pain and swelling in the right thigh and the x ray showed an interference through with a suture disc on the tibial side we traced the history the patient had pain 6 months after the acl reconstruction all done elsewhere the mri was suggested of infective lesion ind was drawn cultures were negative histopathology was not seen symptoms persisted in spite of fibrosis and tazobactam and the patient came to us we did an mri with contrast which showed a thigh abscess femoral tunnel osteomyelitis no intra articular findings graft was intact and tibia was silent and the patient clinically also had thigh pain so we decided that we should debride the thigh avoid any arthrotomy because the knee range of movement was relatively good there was no synovial effusion tibia was silent there was frank pus as soon as we opened the thigh which is what corroborated with the mri a uh, tunnel femoral tunnel was scraped implant was removed and the graft was retained so what we did on the tibial side is we just removed the graft uh, the implants on the tibial side because we did not want any foreign body although there were no signals there but the minute we removed the tibial tunnel graft uh, we realized that the tibial tunnel was absolutely clean so after we debrided cleaned we sent for cultures smear showed afb positive and this is what sir had discussed to dr aisha's question smear was afb positive gene expert was negative and day 5 cultures were negative at the same time the histopathology showed caseous granulomas suggestive of mycobacterial etiology uh, now what this shows is again stressing on the point whenever afb is positive that means there are lots of mycobacteria 10 raised to power of 8 or 9 but gene expert requires only very few 10 raised to power of 2 so very few mycobacteria are required for gene expert to be positive so if afb is positive gene expert should be positive but if afb is positive and gene expert is negative that means we are looking at non tuberculous mycobacteria because gene expert is specific for the standard or typical mycobacteria tuberculosis so we got the inputs from the infection specialist there was a history of in intervention like in the previous case so whenever there is an arthroscopy or an open surgery or an injection or a dye based study with a positive afb smear negative gene expert and histopathology suggestive we must think of non tuberculous mycobacteria and why is it commonly seen with arthroscopes it's more and more often that we see this non tuberculous mycobacteria are predominantly present in tap water and that's the tap water that we use to wash our arthroscopes what happens is these bacteria travel from the water inside the scope they form a biofilm inside the scope the scopes are generally sterilized in sidex or in eto but these non tuberculous mycobacteria are resistant to eto and sidex they multiply they form a big colony there the minute that arthroscope is put inside a joint they get implanted and that's how non tuberculous mycobacteria are commonly seen with arthroscopic procedures so since we had suspected ntm in this case on day 5 a uh, patient was started on empirical ntm therapy consisting of amikacin injectably followed by and lim and linezolid and clarithromycin but the pain pain and fever persisted for 3 weeks uh on day 21 that's 3 weeks uh, that's how long it takes for mycobacteria to grow the ntm to grow and that's why we must insist and communicate with the microbiology team that uh, we are suspecting ntm please do not discard the cultures on day 5 continue their incubation and we grew rapidly growing mycobacteria and here it was resistant to clarithromycin 
and linezolid though susceptible the mic value was high so the antibiotics were changed amikacin was continued ceftran and doxy were started orally changing the clarithromycin and linezolid to simple very old uh, antibiotics going on for decades and as soon as the therapy was changed symptoms resolved this was continued for 6 months and this is his follow up at 4 years with no pain full range of movement and no evidence of infection on mri and the graft was retained as i said the implants were removed the graft was retained so we must think of ntm whenever there is a break in skin from an wound injection arthroscopy open surgery afb positive gene expert negative and histopathology suggestive of granulomas we must think of ntm going to the next case he was a 31 year old with discharging sinus from the tech proximal tibia since one year uh, there was a history of acl reconstruction 14 years back he was absolutely fine doing everything uh, following his sporting activities routine walking running he was asymptomatic till one year back and then he started getting this intermittent purulent discharge from the proximal tibia knee range of movement was full absolutely silent this was the x ray showing an implant at the uh, disc at the tibial site and there was probably a petal of femoral uh so they done as well at the same time so the question was what do we do the patient has a discharge for one year should we retain or remove the acl now let's look at the mris the mris clearly showed that there was necrotic tissue which is on t1 this is a t1 image showing black infected tissue along the subcutaneous aspect on the tibia and within the tibial medullary canal similarly on t2 it was white hyper intense the edema was only in the tibia the femur was black on t2 image which means it was normal and the graft was intact no signals intraarticularly which clearly showed that the infection was was uh, restricted only to the tibia so we excised the sinus tract and the abnormal soft tissue and the minute we opened we got this ethy bond and endo button and that's the foreign body which causes a reaction and causes secondary infection even after 10 to 15 years so we, we removed that scraped the tibial medullary canal and the important thing to note is whenever we put a scoop inside we we found a resistance at the top of the condyle so the roof of the condyle is intact with time uh, biology is just seals of the tibia and the femur from the joint so there was no interarticular extension which was confirmed on the cr the tibial and endobutton uh, endobutton and uh, ethy bond were removed this was the post operative x ray cultures grew methicillin sensitive staph aureus again oxacillin sensitive cefoxidin screen negative simple antibiotics first generation cephalosporin for 2 weeks intravenously followed by fluclox uh, for 4 weeks what we also did uh, is redebrided protein stimulant beads with cefiroxin which is a second generation cephalosporin uh, for these small cavities we use insulin syringe cut the tip put the beads inside and just push it in and we confirm on the cm that we got good spread unfortunately uh, another entity that we've explained is discharge following stimulant which is what happened here because it was a subcutaneous tunnel was directly on the subcutaneous tissue there was no local tenderness no warmth no signs of infection so we just observed and the discharge saw it four weeks although the wound looked a little dicey we just observed we didn't uh, intervene at this stage and the minute the stimulant got resolved the discharge stopped uh, he has an absolutely infection free follow up at one year and now it's been 2 to 3 years since we operated this patient so we must assess each patient based on whether clinically and radiologically it's intraarticular or extraarticular extraarticular most commonly comes from the tibial side we've had cases on the femoral side as well but if the knee is silent we must avoid any intraarticular exploration so not every infection is intraarticular assess clinically radiologically you just removing the source of infection debriding locally in the tibia or the femoral extraarticular area and removing the foreign body itself can resolve the infection so these cases uh, instinct i mean we we realized that we getting a lot of arthroscopy infection so we retrospectively started assessing and i mean try to assess, analyze whether we could form any kind of guidelines for these arthroscopic infections so over a period of 6 years we followed all these patients for at least 12 months after surgery there were eight knee arthroscopy and two shoulder arthroscopy all on empirical antibiotics for varied periods now two important cohorts were formed one was patients who developed early infection within 30 days of the arthroscopic procedure and the other subset of five patients although less five and five but we could clearly define them was the ones who developed infection late after arthroscopy that is at least three months after the arthroscopic procedure unfortunately by the time they presented to us uh, there was a significant delay of two to three years sometimes even longer so the classic 
difference between the two i mean it it was very obvious early surgical infections were very fulminant they were always intraarticular with osteomyelitis of either the tibia femur or both or in a shoulder case of the humerus or the scapula there were portal scar tenderness wherever the arthroscopy portals were put in they were tender and there was a restricted range of movement obviously because of the intraarticular infection late surgical site infections by and large are always extraarticular uh, there is no portal site tenderness and the joint is absolutely silent we must resort to atypical or modified incisions for these intraarticular or early infections to excise all the sinus scars and portals i just highlight one case after this in short and late requires only limited excision limited but adequate debridement of that extra articular area of the scar sinus and the offending foreign body we had to remove graft in all or the infections unfortunately we could not salvage a graft in any of these cases the infection was so fulminant and graft could be retained in all late extra articular cases so again extra articular we don't need to go into the joint we can salvage the graft but the implant must come out because that's the source of the infection non tuberculous mycobacteria were seen in half of our cases now point to note is only two were positive in culture they are so slow growing that only two grow in culture the other three had histopathology suggestive of cases in anomalies and with the history of arthroscopy and these indolent infections we gave empirical ntm therapy and these patients resolved we also found a variety of other bacteria stressing on the fact that we must tend for tb ntm and pyogenic uh, cultures antibiotic duration was varied from 6 weeks for pyogenic to 6 months for ntm so highlighting one of these early infections he was a 28 year old male with early infection following an arthroscopic acl empirical antibiotics were tried for 2 to 3 months then resolved presented to us 4 months after the arthroscopy with pain swelling significant restriction of the knee range of movement with the flexion deformity there was portal site tenderness lateral thigh tenderness and tibial scar tenderness so which showed that the knee tibia and the femur all were infected or all were at least clinically symptomatic x ray already started showing haziness along the articular there was mottled appearance along the articular margins of the tibia and femur there was uh, a suture femur button present posterior laterally and the tibia had a hydroxy appetite through in the tibial tunnel which is it could be faintly seen on the x ray the mri clearly showed a massive synovial thickening and collection femoral tunnel involvement uh tibial tunnel involvement the signals extending up to 13 cm from the joint line so this is the signal on the posterior lateral aspect of the femur where the graft attaches on the sagittal view again it clearly shows the extent of synovial thickness this is the synovial thickness and the effusion sorry mottled appearance in the femur and tibia indicating that there is significant medullary cancellous bone involvement as well here we can see the tibial tunnel sorry again we can see the tibia involvement posterior collection along the posterior lateral femur condyle and that's the extent of infection in this case highlighting how fulminant these early infections can be and how severe in a matter of 4 months almost everything had been destroyed so clinically and radiologically we realized that it was a septic knee there was collection in the femur abnormal signals in the tibia although the graft was described to be intact there were signals all around the graft as well and with 4 months of infection we knew there would be a biofilm all along so we decided to explore all three the knee tibia and femur there were lots of painful scars which needed excision now the question was whether we go for a single incision or we go for multiple small incisions so the issue with multiple small incisions is the area between the incisions would would probably get devascularized because of multiple cuts so what we must think of is atypical or modified incisions as far as graft retention is concerned we must think of these grafts as implants as fractures if this was a fracture with a plate or a nail with significant medullary and extra medullary infection of four months duration would we retain the implant very unlikely similarly in these cases we must not think of retaining the implant uh, the graft maybe in the first month or so like in early surgical site infections after fracture fixation we can go for an arthroscopic lavage try retaining the graft and the implants by doing a thorough arthroscopic debridement 
literature clearly shows that the more number of arthroscopic debridements that we do the higher the chance of failure so one attempt at an arthroscopic debridement in the early stages within a month is what we should try beyond that salvaging the graft becomes extremely difficult i mean it's very it, it parallels fracture fixation in a similar way so this was the incision t means tibial scar p is the portal and f is the femoral scar so this is a curvy linear incision going from the tibial tunnel across the knee joint going laterally to the femoral scar uh the portal scars were excised you can see in the middle picture that these portal scars were also removed and the entire scar was excised as one piece the minute we open the femur there was significant pus on the lateral condyle posterior artery uh the posterior lateral femoral cortex had completely destroyed with the infection there was the, the graft was practically hanging in the air over there it was necrotic we had to excise it to piece meal along with the sutures and the endobutton you can see this artery passing from the intraarticular from the tunnel into the posterior lateral aspect of the femur there was just no bone there all of that had to be chipped off because it was osteomyelitic this was the intraarticular aspect of the knee again completely the patella was retracted medially because it had gone done a lateral arthrotomy along the incision the thick synovium and the necrotic material was going from the anterior to the anterior aspect of the knee to the pcl we scraped off all of that we can see the arrow here on the right hand side uh, the infection had eaten away part of the lateral femoral condyle it had just disappeared so the minute we removed the biofilm there was exposed cancellous bone so there was cartilage anteriorly posteriorly and middle there was just no cartilage it was completely eaten up by the infection we we debrided the tibia and the ha screw was also very loose it came out with an artery scraped the tibial tunnel as well uh, this was the picture after thorough debridement multiple samples were sent as we normally do there was no growth on day 7 uh in this case even afb smear was negative but the histopathology showed epithelioid granulomas again suspecting ntm infection we redebrided and here we used stimulan with a specific combination of vancomycin which covered for staphylococcus polycin which covers for gram negative and amikacin which covers for ntm so empirically we've covered for all three although the histopathology was suggestive of ntm uh since we are putting in local beads we covered all the bacteria possible extended incubation unfortunately did not grow anything uh so the patient was empirically treated with ntm therapy 6 weeks of intravenous amikacin and 6 months of oral linezolid and clarithromycin he improved clinically and hematologically uh, this was an 18 months follow up the range of movement is 5 to 8 he has a stiff knee but there is no laxity infection provides a lot of fibrosis so the knee in in that way does auto stabilize and he has infection remission x ray clearly shows irregular articular margin unfortunately he will he, he does have post septic sequelae and at some stage he will require a knee replacement in the near future so whenever we are dealing with early surgical site infections post arthroscopy like post fracture fixation we must diagnose and identify them early avoid empirical therapy aggressively debride maybe even arthroscopic early debridement but we must debride early do not forget the role of histopathology a lot of cases today have highlighted that even this last case culture was negative based on the histopathology is what he was given ntm therapy think of atypical incisions atypical bacteria graft and implant removal if they are involved and there is intraarticular infection because if if we miss that early infection they end up with significant stiffness in the joint biomechanics to get deranged and they are worse outcomes compared to late surgical site infections and the primary surgery of arthroscopic repair is completely forgotten and gone back so completing the story uh, we had infection remission in all the 10 cases at a two year follow up we had two cases which had recurrence within the first 6 months the one of those was an arthroscopic bank cut repair cultures were negative the histopathology was inconclusive he was treated with empirical ntm still kept having recurrences an aspiration was done uh, usc guided uh, as suggested by dr rajiv somanda which grew acromobacter dendrificans and staph epidermidis i mean these are very slow growing uh, bacteria which though not similar to uh, qt bacterium but they are they, they they also cause chronic slow growing infections and simple oral therapy with septran is what cured him 
and second was an arthroscopic pcl avulsion fixation uh, if time permits to the end of the session or maybe in the group we can discuss that uh, that case because there were certain specific findings in that patient so that was it as far as arthroscopic infections are concerned if there are any questions we will take that now and uh, thank you very much uh, dr menon for a very enlightening talk uh, i am sure many of you would say that why are we discussing post arthroscopy infection here we are not arthroscopists so why should we know about this the reason is more and more arthroscopists are becoming only arthroscopists just post ms they go into arthroscopy and they have almost forgotten the art of open surgery i hope there is no arthroscopist here but uh, you must understand that so they are going to come to you and me for managing their infections so you must keep all these things in mind and think of a typical everything in early early post arthroscopy infections including the incision including the bacteria everything and it is very challenging to plan and execute so you must have a proper planning start developing a habit of writing down on paper your plan your options what are your plan a b c and then again take for clinical photographs again and again we have been saying that clinical photographs are very very important so this is about post arthroscopy infection and uh, then we go to our most important thing and that is management of soft tissue defects management of soft tissue defects dr bimal modi would be discussing that with uh, both of us me and uh, dr menan and there are some five important dictums i am sure I, we have discussed this in the beginning but i will again re emphasize don't go by all these papers only they just tell us that implants are useful role of in, this implant that implant remember especially in infection and open fractures debridement is the most important thing unfortunately in literature there is too much stretch on stress on hardware again wound debridement is a word which is now obsolete after 2020 excision of the wound and extension of the wound we have stressed that point again and again for last 7 weeks it is said that don't judge the book by its cover we will say that don't judge the limb by its x rays again very good x rays but this is the soft tissues so the limb is as good as its cover that's a fourth dictum as good as its cover and not as good as its x rays so the aim is convert open or infected fracture or orthopedic condition into a closed cavity the first thing is to convert it into a closed cavity and therefore you must partner with plastic surgery people lastly don't do it as a last resort the bone is remaining open remaining open remaining open for 6 weeks and 8 weeks and then you do a cover or involve a plastic surgeon which is very likely to fail so in about 3 days time maximum of 1 week you should be able to put close to your naked bone so when you are dealing with infected area it is your job to dig it properly so that you get a decent wound and then your plastic surgery friends will cover it properly so the first step is a good soft tissue cover it is my pleasure and honor to introduce dr bimal modi who is mch plastic surgery we have been working together for last many many years four decades i think he is head department of plastic surgery at pd hinduja hospital mahim there is a very nice institute of micro surgery by johnson and johnson or ethicon at mahim he is a visiting professor there he has been 
uh, occupying many, many important positions in Association of Plastic Surgeons. He's a reviewer of many groups on journals. He's a faculty and demonstrator at of microsurgery at many conferences and symposia. Obviously, he has published several papers at national and uh, international journals. And he also does a lot of social work at Gujarat. Uh, there's a hospital called Mahua, and he's a trustee there and does many camps there for plastic surgery. With that introduction, it is my pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Modi to discuss anatomy of the skin, difference between split thickness graft and full thickness graft, which one to use when, what are the advantages and disadvantages, and of course, most important, how does a common orthopedic surgeon do a split thickness graft? Over to Dr. Modi. Thank you. Everybody, can, can you hear me? Please unmute and say that you can yes, hear sir, Dr. Yeah. Modi. Yes, yes sir. I can hear you clearly. Okay. okay, now see, the thing is like this, that I'll go, instead of wasting too much time, I'll go straight to split skin grafting. Now, split skin grafting is the uh, cornerstone or the easiest way to cover a wound. The skin, as you know, is made up in layers. The epidermis is essentially dead. What we need is to take part of the dermis with the epidermis. Now, as you know, it is taken from the thigh. Uh, Dr. Agashe, if you could show that uh, video. Video of the skin grafting. Yeah, this is the skin grafting handle, the common or Humbi's knife. This is the Watson's modification of the Humbi's knife. This is the one commonly used. The Indian one will cost around 3,000 rupees. Uh, imported one will be maybe 30,000, but the Indian Indian ones work well. And uh, the adjustment is based on the numbers there, but basically around two is the uh, adjustment one does. Try not to open up too much, otherwise there is the incised wound that develops. And try not to use the blade again. One use and throw away, it is not expensive. It costs less than a packet of suchupai or vikril. So this is the Humbi's knife. The next video, sir. How the graft is taken, you need to lubricate the thigh with paraffin or any KY jelly or lignocaine jelly and give traction and lift up the skin graft. Uh, the graft should not be too thick or too thin. I am sorry, but a little experience is needed in this. Once you do it four or five times, I am sure you will be able to make out. There is no constant guideline. Now, this is the skin graft measure. It is made by Zimmer, but Indian ones are also available. It expands the skin graft and allows you to uh, cover a larger area. The plastic on which the graft is kept is the one that gives you the expansion. On it, it is written 1 is to 1.5, 1 is to 3, 1 is to 5, depending on how much expansion you have to do. In orthopedics, 1 is to 1.5 or 1 is to 3 is enough. We need larger expansions in cases of burns when we are very short of skin. So the split skin grafting is the commonest way of covering. I personally think that it is a little underused by the uh, orthopedic surgeons, not because of any other reason, but they are just not familiar with it. It's no big deal. The patient loses nothing because in 12 to 14 days, new skin comes there. And you can take another skin graft from the same donor area every 17 days for three times. So basically, patient loses nothing. And by split skin grafting, whether meshed or even in sheets, one, two important things happen. One is that you will definitely cover 70, 80, 90 percent of the wood. And second thing is that you will come to know which tissue is alive and which is not alive. 
any live tissue will allow skin graft to uh, stay whether it is living bone whether it is living tendon with keratinon whether it is granulation tissue whether it is muscle every piece of living bone living tissue will take a graft so we should whenever we are in a difficulty or finding it difficult to close the wound split skin graft it it acts as a beautiful temporary biological dressing and definitely some part of the wound will get closed with it. the full so thing is dr modi yes is people who do not have this measure can they use 11 number blade that is what we used to do for ages isn't it yes sir the 11 number blade makes beautiful holes but it does not really expand the graft but in orthopedics you are rarely short of uh, graft so it's fine you can use a blade and just make make okay okay so this okay. is what you had done i mean the debridement was done by us and yes this is a graft mesh, you had mesh done. graft for put and uh, honestly that day i thought you have messed up the case by by using too much of measure but uh, i mean we were wrong because this is at 7 months and this is at uh, 18 months so not only the graft took the intervening area also was covered so can you just explain how this happens this happens it by the spreading of the graft from the holes from the holes uh, okay. from the edges of the graft the epithelial cells slowly migrate and cover the wound okay 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 now so, full th- full thickness grafts basically not very useful in orthopedics because uh, wherever you take the full thickness graft from you have to do something to close that wound so large areas cannot be taken it is good for cosmetic uh, grafting on the face and things like that the other thing is flaps flaps are pieces of skin which have their own blood supply in this slide you can see that there is a area on the dorsum of the finger where there is a tendon exposed there if you put a split skin graft that tendon will get adherent so a small flap has been transposed to cover the tendon and the remaining part will be split skin grafted we'll go into that in the next slide so these are the advantages and disadvantages of split thickness graft yes see this is a full thickness graft for a uh, pigmented lesion of the lower eyelid this full thickness graft is a small graft you can take it gives very good cosmetic result see the uh, i'll just answer uh, mr dr goel's question the uh, it is very difficult to give advice how much gap to keep but the thing is like this that uh, if uh, if if a 15 number blade goes through that gap that is enough do not try to open more than that open enough for a 15 number blade to slide through that gap because the thickness of the graft you will take out depends on two things one is how big the gap is and second how hard you press if you press hard then a, even a narrow gap will give you a thick graft so basically do not open more than a 15 number blade thickness i hope that answers your question uh, yes sir uh, also uh, a lot of times i have encountered incised wounds uh, so maybe the pressure is getting a little too much yeah so you keep the gap very less and start and the worst nothing will happen you will not cut anything then you can open up the uh, blade a little the gap a little okay sir okay so that incised wounds then you have to stitch it and leave the bad feeling yes sir <laughs> can i ask a question sir Yes, yes. Uh, so, in years of training, we were taught to take the graft and put it in normal saline. Yeah. I found the practice amongst plastic surgeons not to use the normal saline because the skin that you are taking itself has got properties to adhere to. 
So what is the practice correct? Whether, whether you take the donor graft and put it in normal saline and then you uh, spread it out on the, on the bed or do you spread it out directly? Well, there is tissue thromboplastin on the undersurface of the graft which helps to make it stay. But right. the quest question is whether you, after you have taken out the graft, keep it in saline or not. The answer is, it depends on how ready your bed is. If you, your bed is ready, then you can just take out the graft and directly put it on top. If you feel that the hemostasis is not enough or some more debridement is needed, then you better keep the graft in the saline and finish that before you put it. Right, sir. The and hematoma uh, between the bed and the graft is what makes you lose the graft. Right. So, and the dressing that we were used, still I use it, is putting at least two layers of soaked gauze piece, fully soaked gauze piece with saline, and then put dry gauze piece and then put padded dressing to secure the graft. Is it yeah. that you yeah, do? The thing is, the thinking, thinking is like this, that for the first 24 to 48 hours, the graft gets its... Uh, blood supply by inosculation, meaning there is that uh, seroma which it exudes from the wound. After that, capillaries develop around the third day between the bed and the graft. So basically for 48 hours, you don't want any movement between the bed and the graft. Right, so so uh, what I do and what most plastic surgeons will do is to put a non-adhesive dressing on as the first layer, whether you use Vaseline gauze, whether you use Sopra tool, whether you use uh, any other type of, if you don't have anything else, you can use one full tube of Neosporin ointment in a gauze. But make that a non-stick layer. Mm. After that, whatever you want, you put moist gauze, you put Gamji, you put whatever, doesn't matter. So moist gauze does not have an advantage over, you know, the first layer is fine, sir. Give a Sopra 2D or a Gym yeah, the, the, mo the advantage of moist gauze is that it uh, it uh, layers the contour better than dry gauze. Means if there is a depression, if yeah. there is a bump at some area or if it is raised in another area, the moist gauze will fill it up better than a dry gauze. Right. Second thing is the moist gauze will soak up the discharge also a little better than dry gauze. That is the advantage of uh, moist gauze. You can, people are soaking it in, bitted in, whatever you like, it doesn't make much difference. Right, sir. Can Thanks. you tell us something about the, the burn mesh that you have been using? See, this burn mesh is made by Surgiware company. I have no shares in Surgiware, but a A4 size uh, piece costs around maybe 300 rupees. It is like Sofra tool, but it is made of polypropylene and is very, very non adherent So I like to use it. It is sterile, ready, and different sizes are available. It's called burn mesh. It was originally de designed for burns, but I use it for uh, the first layer of the skin graft. There was a question by Dr. Patidar on uh, uh, when do we change dressing and uh, immobilization of the skin graft. Yeah, see, like I told you, the first 48 hours, there needs to be zero movement between the graft and the bed. So you need to immobilize that area which you have grafted. Now, I would not expect you to be putting skin grafts on the stomach and thorax and areas which are inherently moving. Those areas which you cannot stop movement, it is better to do what we call open grafting, meaning stitch the... Uh, graft on that mobile area and leave that wound open so that there is no tangential uh, movement. The second part is when will you do the first dressing? Now, after 48 hours, you can do the first dressing. It depends on how clean the wound is. If you are expecting pus or discharge to lift off the graft, then to do a dressing little earlier is better, around the second, third day or so. If you have got a totally clean wound, then even five days is okay if you don't touch. Uh, people are using wax as a dressing on top of the skin graft with good results. I have nothing against it. If there is a lot of discharge expected, I would use it. But it adds to the expense, so I use it judiciously. I think uh, the couple of cases that we had used were exposed calcaneum. 
where we had grafted and we had used back because of the cancellous bone bleeding. Okay. Yeah, if rare, there is rare situations, lot of uh, discharge expected either blood or whatever, then it has a good role to play. So you would not put it as a default. You would use it only. I, in I am. I know uh, my plastic surgery colleagues. Some of them are using it as a default. Yeah. I have not found the need to do that. Okay. It is like, uh, in my opinion, it is like an atom bomb. And if you want to kill a mosquito, atom bomb will do that. But do you need it every time? Sometimes O'Donnell is in us. Okay. Uh, also, uh, sir. two hands that are raised. Yes. Sorry? Yes. Uh, sir, normally we uh, put back in an intermittent mode. Five minutes off and two minutes off. Uh, off. Yeah. Over... Skin graft, uh, the KCI company, they suggest that it should be in a continuous mode. Any thoughts on that, sir? Yeah. If you are going to use it continuous. Okay. okay. But I am not saying you should use all the time. Although I know few plastic surgeons who are doing that and I am not fighting with anybody. But I think it is a little overkill. Okay. No, uh, the question is whether you would put it in continuous mode or intermittent continuous. mode. Continuous. Continuous okay. mode because otherwise there will be deformation and the chances that the flap will be raised. Continuous. Continuous. Okay. okay. Uh, so may I ask which Indian measure you are using? I have not used or seen an Indian measure. Uh, there, there is pressure surgical. See, next time there is a little plastic surgery conference somewhere in your city. And there are these stalls there, you know. All India Surgical, there is Wilson and Wilson. There are many people who make Indian measures which are not too expensive, around 25,000 or so. Hmm. But uh, there is a consumable part in it. You know, the measure, that plastic sheet which you saw, that is uh, not uh, repeatedly usable. It is meant to be thrown away after every use. I use it around three, four times uh, after ETOing. But uh, that is the cost. Means every case you have to spend on. Right, sir. Uh, if, uh, if okay, uh, if there are no more uh, questions, uh, let's ask, go ahead um, with the flap. Because in, in, in ortho, orthopedics, as Doctor Agashya was saying, if you use the eleven number blade, it is enough. You all don't need very big grafts. You know, we need for burns and areas like that. You all ultimately need a one thigh at the most. One thigh, if you make with the 11 number blade, you make holes, you'll be okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, this you sir, are... can, I ask, can I ask one yes. small question, sir? So, there was a practice uh, at certain certain point of time using placenta, fresh placenta to cover wounds, raw wounds. There was a bit controversy about it, and then it went into disrepute. I have used personally on two cases and found it good. Before I could put skin graft on the raw wound, I have used fresh placenta. Uh, what is the take of Dr. Modi on that? And what's the current scenario? It's been years. It is, there, uh, there are two aspects of this. One is that on the donor area, means from where you have taken the skin, there are almost 40 things you can put, you know, starting with just Vaseline gauze, with paraffin gauze, with uh, placenta, with... Uh, uh, amniotic membrane, collagen sheets, uh, oxide, any smooth membrane reduces pain. Right. Now, if you're talking about uh, uh, replacing before skin grafting, if you want a temporary dressing, That's what then, then I think in today's day and age, probably the best thing would be WAC. If yeah, you yeah, if this you pre vac era, this was pre vac era. Yeah, this what you are talking about is pre vac area. Pre -vac era. Era. Yeah. So today, if you ask me what would I do, I would put vac. If I don't have access to vac, which may happen, there is a thing called collagen sheet, which is which comes in something like a suture packet. It is a dry, looks like tissue paper sheet. Cost A4 size will cost around eight hundred rupees. I would recommend you buy one packet. It has a long shelf life of about four years or so. And it is an excellent temporary decision for wounds you don't want to cover or cannot cover. 
Okay. Because to get uh, amnion or to get amniotic membrane or all that is not easy when you want it. This is a ready-made packet sterile which you just keep in your hospital nursing home when you need to cover. Just open the packet and put it on. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Thank you. Sir. Start with the case. This was a sixty-year-old female. She presented post. Total knee replacement with a discharging sinus. Here you can see that's the incision, that's the sinus, which is away from the incision, almost a, a couple of inches away from incision and not in the line of incision. But she had a discharging sinus. So obviously we need to have a good debridement and B, we need to cover We need to cover this part very well. So, how do we get cover? The first step, of course, is excision of the sinus tract, exploration of the wound, and thorough debridement. There is no doubt about that. After that, what do we do? So, this is what uh, we did with Dr. Modi, and I opened. You can see there is a rent here. The culture was pan-sensitive staphylococcus. And then this is what Dr. Modi has planned. Can you just explain, Dr. Modi? This is a rotation flap. Basically, I'm not taking much credit in this. You know, if you have done a thorough debridement like Dr. Agashe does and you've got giving good antibiotics, even if you do some small procedure, <laughs> the wounds will heal. Here we have taken the skin like the arrow is showing and turned it round to uh, cover that excise strand. Now, uh, so remember, this was joint. Uh, joint. I insisted that we have a good flap cover. So if you can, yeah, that's yeah. the. Now, as you can see, that the flap has come and closed the wound. Please remember that the, the mathematics behind this flap, that if you could go back to, uh, yeah, okay, that's fine. Next one. One more. See, that whatever the size and shape of the wound, make it into a triangle. That take any one side as X, do an imaginary 3X uh, line, and make a circle on that with the center at 2x, obviously. And that is a rotation flap which will cover uh, any wood. You don't need to know any other blood supply. You don't, This is a random pattern flap. You don't need to know which artery is supplying. You don't need to know anything except that x and 3x. And try to keep the 3x or the base of the flap proximal. If you could go back behind one slide, this going, the base of the flap, as you can see, is towards the groin. Do not keep the base towards the foot because the blood supply is from proximal to distal. As you can see, this whatever the shape of the uh, uh, defect, make it into a triangle, X and 3X, and just rotate that flap to cover the wood. Keep the base proximal. Any question? This is another one, same uh, type of uh, rotation flap. It's uh, reasonably easy to do. You don't need to know any blood supply. You just need to know that you need to keep a big uh, base. It is useful for areas where you can take a big flap. It's, it is You can't do rotation flaps on a finger or a small area like that. The lines represent the expansion of the skin as you have done the flap. It's a very nice flap to give good quality, thick, sensate skin on uh, areas where you need it without uh, too much technical knowledge. Have you seen this? Sir. Sorry? 
bed sores, pressure sores, they can be covered very well with this. Yes, bed, bed sores are very useful because the buttock skin is very reasonably good. mobile and large. Yeah. This is an advancement flap. It is just advanced superiorly to cover the excise that bed sore and cover it. So can you just explain this as the left hand side first drawing? See the basic principle is like this that the where those two triangles are drawn that is the base of the flap. One needs to understand that the base uh, and length has a very very important uh, ratio. If the base is one is uh, x, then the length cannot be more than one and a half x. You cannot have a long and narrow flap. The flap has to be x base, then the length can be x and a half, one and a half x. So that is what we have done. We have excised that uh, bed so we have advanced the flap and we have stitched it. Those two small triangles I have excised, but that is just to be uh, cosmetically better. Otherwise, you will get small dog ears. Okay, okay. Now, what do you do to these? One has to make it look difficult, otherwise, people think plastic surgery is easy. Okay. What do you do with these defects? You put a split thickness graft or. No, no, you stitched it. You stitched it. Stitch it. Okay, okay. This is what y'all will, the orthopedic surgeons call by uh, release incision. We call bipedical flap because it has two pedicles proximal and distally. This uh, little x and 2x diagram needs to be remembered. Basically, it is good for long linear defects, especially on the tibia. You take a release incision posteriorly till the and the flap must, in today's thinking at least, include the fascia. In the good old days, we used to do only skin flaps, but now we take fasciocutaneous flaps, which add to the sturdy of the flap, but make it a little more difficult to move. And that 2x where it is written, that posterior part, uh, there will be a long linear defect there, which must be skin grafted. Do not get tempted to uh, stitch that. So you move the flap anteriorly. Here we have moved the flap towards the heel. And as you can see, we have put a skin graft on the near the anchor. This is the excellent method of covering small defects. This is like a bucket handle. It moves downwards and on top, if there is some tendon on the TA, then we can put a small skin graft. This is a common problem. So I just see so, a case where this bipedical flap was done. Young man presented post tibia nailing. The infection had persisted in spite of nail removal. And the soft tissues anteriorly, as you can see here, are compromised. So the first step, of course, was very aggressive excision. I have just excised this area. And then Dr. Modi has done a release incision and covered this or closed this defect. Now I fell in a trap of giving good, good bone grafts. Here you can see I've just stuffed the area with bone grafts, massive grafting. This is a very common problem. So try and understuff the defect because then it becomes quite easy to cover. So unfortunately here, I stuffed it, the closure was difficult, and then the wound gave way, he again uh, became infected, and this is what uh, I had to do, take out all the grafts and put, splay, put uh, cement beads. There's practically no bone in the defect. Now we discussed about magic of nature. Again, I'll show you magic of nature. So this is an envelope which is open anteriorly, which was closed, but I overstuffed it, again got infected. 
So again, I debrided, put cement beads. And here you can see, I was a bit scared of keeping, taking out the cement at six weeks. So I put it for, maintained it for three and a half, four months. And at four months, you can see it's again infected. So that's a very common thing if you keep cement for a long time. But what is important is here you can see the bone that has already formed. I'll show you the previous x-ray. There is no bone there. While this is at four months, you can see it's already forming bone or rather formed bone, though it is infected from inside. So this is what was there. And uh, then this was a time when we used VAC. Today, there is no point in discussing VAC, but here you can see we did a thorough debridement, used VAC, and that VAC itself closed the wound. Every time there was improvement. So we maintained it. And here you can see we have got an envelope. We have got a good envelope, but we have got a cleft. We have got a cleft. And then as we discussed last time, the bone will form in the area and take the shape of that envelope. So the bone here took the shape of the envelope. Here you can see this is at three years, this is at four years. No bone grafting was done after that. This is at nine years. And the cleft is slowly filling up. As you can see here, the cleft is slowly filling up. And that's the appearance. And that's his function. So, Dr. Modi, can you just give a few tips about bipedical flaps? Do you shown use it, them as commonly as you used to use earlier? The two things. One is that in the good old days, y'all used to do a lot of these 12 or 14 old tibia nailing the platings. And we used to see a lot of these plate exposed. For them, this we used to do either cross leg flap or this posterior release. But now because of uh, not using that plates, 14 old plates and being we much more... Use them, but but our much less. Has improved. Yes, much less. The indications are defined well. The in, technique is improved. When to do has also... In uh, last 15 years, I haven't seen a 14 old plate exposed. No, no, no. Exposed, yes. So, all our plates remain covered then? Yes. So, nowadays we don't need to do either cross leg or this posterior release. See, I'm not talking about micro flaps because for me to do a micro flap in most cases is quite easy. A large amount of skin and soft tissue I can take and cover almost any wound. But I'm not talking about it in today's forum because I do not expect orthopedic surgeons to do micro flaps. I, today we are trying to show you things which you can do. If you could do a micro flap, then most of the wounds can get covered. So we are not showing micro flaps. It's, you need a lot of uh, equipment expertise in, uh, for doing micro flaps. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So go to the next case. We have already discussed this case in infection after open fractures. So I'll run through, but Dr. Modi will discuss how to cover this wound. So this was a forklift injury treated with single midline incision. Day 10, there was a surgical site infection. We had to remove the implants. That's the clinical photo. We had to remove the implants. And there was a large area of granulation tissue here, large skin defect. And this is where we are. We have a large defect. And then, Dr. Modi, can you explain how we can use a non-micro flap? And yes. See, the upper third defects of the tibia generally can be covered with a gastronomous flap, either a medial or a lateral gastronomous flap. It can be either only muscle or it can be muscle and skin. The muscle and skin cover the larger area, but the defect means the deformity in the leg is cosmetically much worse. So upper third defects are that way easy to cover as long as gastronomous is there. Middle third, you could put a soleus flap. Lower third are a nightmare. 
difficult to cover because there is very little soft tissue there. A reversed uh, sural flap is commonly done, or then one has to think of either cross leg or a micro flap. The flap is on the dorsalis pedis that is also turned around. Commonly used, not or not? No, sir. Nowadays, dorsal fetus flap is not clever of the ear because the donor defect is very bad. People can't wear chappal and uh, the skin graft on the dorsal of the foot keeps on breaking down. Okay. okay. It's okay. out of fashion. So, here so, you would think of either a fasciocutaneous or a gastrocutaneous. This is what uh, Dr. Modi did. And yes, sir. Like I was saying, if you take a facial cutaneous, then the donor area does look a little funny. So, if if possible, I would take only muscle and skin graft it. But if you need a larger area to cover, then one has to do a facial cutaneous. Okay. Somebody is, I, some Dr. Aisha is asking whether rotation flap can be done. Rotation flap is essentially for small defects. On the tibia, the flap becomes too big to try a rotation. Yeah. So, again, wonders of nature. You can see he has already started forming bone. I have not even put grafts. That's the cement, large cement blocks. Posteriorly, has already started forming bone. Laterally, as well as medially, has started forming bone. And then I did a massive grafting at eight weeks. This is at 18 weeks, he is walking. This is at two years when the, everything is consolidated. So coming to the next case, we have discussed this case earlier. Slow growing atypical mycobacterial infection. These are the intraoperative images. We have excised this bone, and then Dr. Modi has done a flap here. So, can you discuss what is fasciocutaneous flap, local fasciocutaneous flap, and how does a common orthopedic surgeon plan yeah. and execute this flap? See, my thinking is always like this that I don't try to do uh, micro flap as the first option. Maybe it is just my age. I mean, people, my juniors, by 15 years, first option would be a micro flap. It's, it's an easy thing to do. You take a big block of tissue from somewhere and just cover it. Now, when I see a wound like this, I split the wound in my mind into split skin graftable and flap requires flap cover. See, if you if you observe the upper part of the wound has red muscle, there is really no need to cover that with a flap. There is a certain part of the wound which has bone exposed, which requires a flap cover. So I would plan a split skin graft where there is a uh, soft tissue below that, either granulation or muscle, and put a small flap just where it is needed. Today's concept is now no skin flaps only, but fasciocutaneous, meaning skin flaps with fascia to give better blood supply. So here we have put a small fasciocutaneous flap on the fracture site and we have put skin graft above and below that. And it does reasonably well. So do you do any pre-op imaging to find out whether there is adequate blood supply on the lateral aspect or locate the what you keep calling perforator. Can you just explain us a bit about these perforators? See, the, per the concept is like this, that the deep arteries uh, supply elements of the skin, which they perforate the muscle and deep fascia and come directly to supply the skin. So with a Doppler, one can pick up the uh, blood supply of a, a particular area and then be more confident instead of having a random pattern flap without knowing where the blood supply is coming from. One could do also a, a, a CT angio to show the blood supply. And nowadays, there is this uh, dye which is injected and one can 
see the blood supply with a special camera, but they are too high tech for day to day use. The Indocine in green is the guy which you inject IV, and then you have to see it under uh, a special camera uh, which shows blood supply. So, before doing a local rotation visuocutaneous flap, one has to use a Doppler no. to identify the perforator? No. no. No, it's not necessary. What uh, one needs to do is you need to remember the length breadth ratio. If it is X, you can take a 1.5 X uh, length. If you maintain that, generally you should have no problem. I am okay. not, not advocating high-tech solutions. High-tech solutions are for high-tech hospitals, not for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So, these are serial images. We have already discussed that. Now, again, how do you open a flap? Because very often we have to do reconstructive procedures. So, how does one open the flap for reconstructive procedures? The same way as you have put the flap, meaning that you can lift up uh, the flap uh, uh, in that x, 1.5x, in the length breadth ratio. Here you have shown that uh, how you have lifted up the area and as long as you don't cut the base, you are okay. Okay. So we go uh, along the margin of the flap. We should yeah. never cut through the flap. No. Huh? Don't cut through the flap. Don't cut through the flap. And Again, how much do we open? You so can open a big flap like this. How much 50, do we open? About 60%. Okay, okay. So this is, is this a bipedical flap. We already seen this case. Is this a bipedical flap like uh, Sir was explaining? No, this is a transposition flap. So you're taking the skin and, and the fascia from the lateral aspect of the lower no. leg and moving no, it from, from the anterior aspect. You can see the skin graft there, near the ankle. Not this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see I have taken up the flap and just transposed it. So you are taking it from the up lower, uh, upper part of the leg, which is red. From, yeah. No, I'm not following, sir. I'm sorry, I'm not following. Where have you taken it from? The, the upper part of the wound or the lower part? Which one is the donor area? The donor area or the pedicle is laterally. Okay. And, and uh, the flap was, before I cut it, that uh, was the flap. Okay. Going to Can the you, uh, ankle. Dr. Modi, huh? Dr. Modi, if you go on the top, you will have what is called annotation. And you will have a pencil. If so I go to the top of your screen, okay, and there would be annotation. You can get a pen there, and then explain. So I, I have got my annotation. Uh, can is it seen? Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Please. So if you could explain, I've got my annotation here. The arrow is here. Yes, the the flap, uh, Aditya. If you could just show it. Yeah, the white, the white arrow is here. On the donor area. Aditya. You can't? No. Okay, and Aditya. Now uh, see, now that uh, where Aditya Menon is written, ah, yes. that, that yes. is the uh, part from where I have lifted the flap. Okay. The flap was going straight down. I have cut it and brought it, moved it medially. Okay, sir. Yeah, I understand now. So it's gone from here. To here. Yeah. Uh, sir, could you please explain the dimensions uh, that uh, you took into consideration here? That X and 1.5 X, meaning the base, if it is 1 centimeter, you can lift up a flap which is 1.5 centimeters long, mm -hmm. like a matchbox. You understood? No, sir, like, I did not understood possibly. Yes, sir. Yes. Like a matchbox, so, basically I all you can draw on the screen. I don't know how to do that. No, uh, uh, Aditya will do that. Yeah. Aditya, if you can just draw here. So, say this is the defect. And 
So this length would be x. Is, no, see what you have drawn is the flap. Suppose then the lower part is so say x. Then yeah, that is x. Then this flap is too long. It is okay. x plus half x, one and a half x. It, yeah, it that's be. that's it. It should be one point five. Yeah. If it is facio cutaneous, you may get away with two x, but it will be wiser to keep it one point. So, so what you are saying generally, flaps would be rectangular. Absolutely, like, like a matchbox, basically. Correct. So, whatever the base is, is x. So, the side of the rectangle becomes one point five. Right? That's it. Hey, so any, anywhere anywhere in the body. You don't have to know anything more. So, may I ask, what is the angle of rotation that is uh, this flap will allow? See, if, if you uh, take a skin flap only, not fascia, then it moves much easier. But this will go 60 degrees. Fascia cuteness will move 60 degrees? Yeah. Okay. See, okay. If, if you find that it is uh, uh, difficult to move, take a little generous flap. I mean, take a flap which is a little bigger than you absolutely need. So then even if there is a dog ear or difficulty in uh, turning, you should be you will be able to cover the board. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Very nice explaining. One more thing. One more thing. See, there is a phenomenon called delay. Now, if you are not desperate to cover the bone just now, but you can do it after, say, four or five days, or the wound is not fit to be covered, then you lift up the flap and put it back to its original place. So you just give it three, four days to what we call delay, means get used to that blood supply. Then you transpose. Have I explained that? Properly? Yeah, yeah, so you lift up the flap, put it back to its original place. After five days, lift it up and transport. Most commonly used to do with the abdominal flaps. Anywhere. See, I am not making your life difficult. I am keeping things simple. I am not uh, telling, I yeah. telling you things which you will find difficult to do, meaning know which perforator, know which artery. No, I am not doing that. I am just talking anywhere in the body, whether it be a scalp, abdomen, arm, leg, anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Sir? Uh, Aditya, your uh, annotation needs to be removed. Sir, uh, there are certain instances in which uh, necrosis occurs of these flaps. Sir. So, what could, could be the possible causes apart from infection, uh, like intraoperative technical considerations or something which can cause necrosis of the flap? And uh, what is the way to uh, prevent that, sir? The necrosis of the flap essentially is ischemic. Means your design of the flap has not been right. That is what is causing the necrosis. Infection is secondary. Basically, once tissues are dead, they get infected. So there is really nothing that can uh, uh, help you unless you are, you have this endocyanin grain and that special camera, which on the table will sh show you that the edges are well perfused. If they are not, then they, there is nothing. Once you have cut the flap and it is not bleeding, you have nothing you can do. So do you, do you, do you give any blood thinners, etc. after flap? Exactly. Sorry? Do you give any blood thinners after the flap? No. No. Okay. Yes, Dr. Nag wanted to ask something. Same question. Are you using heparin or low molecular heparin? Or any Nothing. Yeah, that's no, I mean. in micro flaps, yes, not in protein. Okay. The whole trick is to, to accurate uh, uh, geometry of the flap. And then if you are little still shaky with it, then delay the flap.
Thank you, sir. It was a very good, very good lecture. Revised a lot of things. I've been doing skin grafting and local flaps for years now because uh, that's how we were trained. Uh, not every time we got the help of a plastic surgeon to do small stuff like this. Uh, it was a, quite a bit of revision and thank you for the small insights that you gave us. <laughs> Welcome. But I would encourage everybody to skin graft, please. The more skin grafting you do, the less uh, problems you will have. I routinely use it, sir. I routinely graft my patients. First. Always. Okay. So, uh, we will discuss a bit about infection after joint replacement and role of flap in that. So, this was a middle-aged person, 60 whose bilateral TKR was done in October 18, developed pain just in two months' time on the left side, developed purulent discharge from left knee. And uh, before he presented to us, he was debrided three times. The last surgery consisted of implant removal and articulated spacer. This is how he presented. You can see the skin is not very good. And he is just about bearing with, barely walking with walker, had a significant pain. That's the spacer. And he came in with this report of atypical mycobacteria. You would say whether these, these atypical mycobacteria are more common in Mumbai. So not that they are more common in Mumbai, they are generally picked up well. That's all. Uh, but otherwise, they are common everywhere. They are ubiquitous. So, mycobacterium abscesses, and this is the debridement. You can see there's a significant amount of pus inside the medullary cavity, inside the medullary cavity. Since he was debrided, already debrided three times, and the infection had not come under control, this was going on for almost 18 months, we decided that enough is enough. We will do a arthrodesis rather than using a two-stage procedure or a single, single stage of course was out of question, but even two-stage. So here you can see the decent debridement on this side, but unfortunately if you see the femur is absolutely bare. Femur is bare. That is the time when we thought of using what is called a Cleanse. Uh, Aditya, what is the full name of this? Cleanse. Cleanse choice. Cleanse choice. 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 Cleanse choice. Cleanse choice. That is a recently introduced foam, and here you can see the excellent granulation formation on this. Now, what do we do, Dr. Modi? See, like I told you, upper third uh, tibia defects. Upper third tibia defects, basically, if the posterior part is untraumatized, it's quite easy to do a gastronomous, uh, myocutaneous, or only a muscle flap. That's what we have done. It covers the whole knee area very nice. You so, can do see you just tie the leg like this? This seems to be, you have tied the leg. That is because, sir, you take so many photographs while operating. I don't have patience to lift the leg. <laughs> okay. A bit more about the size of this and gastronomies. And a, a couple of tips for orthopedic surgeons to use gastronomies as a flap. It's quite a simple flap. As long as you remember that you can go about... Uh, four inches above the ankle, till that much length you can take. And uh, you split the gastronomius in the midline posteriorly, take the skin with the muscle and swing it as a transposition flap to wherever you need. You can cover the knee joint, you can cover upper third tibia, you can cover till middle third tibia. But the cosmetic results are not very... <laughs> nice, but ultimately cover it does. Yes. Safe flap. 
Mirror eye. Safe. So that is what we did. The most important thing was get using an external fixator appropriately as uh, we have been discussing again and again. Use the bone as another column. So it has to go into one another. If that goes into one another, the fixators do not work as non-union machines. So here you can see he has an excellent consolidation at six months. This is a bit about this VAC Vera flow. Are you people aware of this uh, new VAC? Has anyone used it? Not yet, sir. I've seen one, but okay. I've not okay. used it. So there's a wound contact layer of 0.8 centimeters thickness. And these two are two more layers. So there is a, the deeper most layer is wound contact layer with multiple holes, you can see, perforated. And these holes actually help in uh, a good suction of necrotic material. The inflow helps you in dissolving or solubilizing wound debris and uh, that is during the soak phase and during suction phase you take out that material again as uh, you rightly mentioned it is not to be used intermittently because if you keep doing that then the outer seal is going to break and you will lose everything so it is to be used in continuous mode but gives you a very very good granulation tissue formation. Of course, the foam is weak and therefore should not be put in deep cavities or blind areas because the, the whole foam can break. You will not know that you have put a foam inside and it will work like a foreign body. So, this is the latest. Can I say, say something? Not every case we should use that. Most of the cases are amenable to our standard uh, negative pressure therapy. Only in exceptional circumstances where suppose there is an extensive necrotic tissue. You have removed more, most of it, but you are not really sure whether they have gone into deep areas or slough has gone in the deep areas. That is the case when you can use this or when patient is just not fit for uh, anesthesia, especially patients who have bed sores and they are not fit for anesthesia, then you can use this cleanse in still foam. Uh, Agashya, sir, one minute. Yes, please. Uh, just to uh, ask your opinion, uh, is it worth putting a non-stick layer as the first layer in uh, before you use VAC? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, wound uh, contact layer is something which is very useful, especially when you are going to put it on the bone, especially when you are going to put it on the muscle. So, uh, Dr. Modi uses... Uh, Burn mesh. Burn mesh. And we have also started using burn mesh. So non-contact layer is very, very useful in such cases. If you yeah. don't have burn mesh, use sofra tool or use paracetamol. Yes. But use something. There is a there is a case report of uh, uh, this vacuum uh, drain used for uh, post-CABG sternal wound uh, breakdown. And when they removed the mesh, patient died on the table because the whole heart just burst. Correct. correct, correct. So one needs to sometimes use a non-stick non first layer. Thank you, Dr. Modi. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, we are just two minutes to 11.30. So, sorry. Canadian time. My, my time is 11.30. So, uh, Dr. Thakur, sir, if you can just Discuss yes, what we discussed today. Uh, today we had a very variegated presentation, but very interesting and very informative as well. We started with uh, something we thought was gas gangrene and turned out to be an entirely different thing. Uh, it came out that the chronic hematomas is not a diagnosis of choice and should be avoided all the time. Uh, of course, uh, <sighs> We saw through how that invest, uh, how you should be inquisitive about finding it out and not just take a diagnosis like this, a chronic hematoma. 
only be keeping the mind open and sending histology histopathology and culture that led to the resolution of the first case that was so called a uh, gas gangrene of course in days of investigation we had to go for mri all the time and we had an excellent exposition about mri of that particular case and also some examples of how to find out uh, more about a case by doing mris then we had a wonderful expose on the non tubercular microbacterium this is a entity which is now being discussed more often so more and more people are open to this kind of uh, uh, aggression from mycobacteria and are also ready to face it and treat it <clears throat> i mean it was very unfortunate the case that he just had an arthrography and he had this and uh, ntm infection which uh, almost destroyed his, his which actually destroyed his joint uh, that was bad i never thought this would come happen but one should be careful even for a minor ingression of a joint just arthrography leading to this disaster is something we ought to remember in our day to day practice another eye opener was arthros post arthroscopy infection all these years i thought the arthroscopy doesn't get infected but till this evening now i am i'm really worried when next time doing arthroscopy i should be more careful and i resolved that not to wash the arthroscopes with uh, tap water but use uh, distilled water or a saline water every time the scope is washed thank you dr aditya to bring the tour with us then those five dictums about uh, covering a wound were very 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 enlightening and one would like to remember all those all the time having done that we came to dr modi's uh, expose of uh, skin cover uh, in my opinion orthopedic surgeon should have two very close friends one is an anesthetist and another is a plastic surgeon with these two people then you could be a successful orthopedic surgeon anywhere in the world thank you for telling us about skin grafting the tip i liked most was the using a 15 uh, number blade to open up that gap any number of times we do it we are always not sure what's going to happen but when i heard this trick from you last day lecture just 15 number gap blade i have been using it very successfully and very confidently so thank you dr modi for split skin sure we would like to use split skin and we do in our small way do split skin grafting but in cities like bombay we are spoiled we have for one call we get two plastic surgeons to help us so we said okay fine let's call dr modi and uh, i would take a coffee break a split signal graft and full thickness graft uh, uh, grafts also were very uh, enlightening flaps of course of the cakes and your uh, your advice on rotation flap advancement flap bipedical flap fascio cutaneous flap was very very interesting we would need more training to use them freely but uh, i suppose people who are independent in smaller areas they could learn this and really help their patients very well lastly the infections in joint replacement was again a eye opener and we have been hearing about this many times but when it comes to real deep infection we would like to follow all the dictums that we have discussed this evening so overall it was a, a different uh, module variegated in areas but the plastic surgery was the real gain from today's lecture thank you very much thank you very much sir so are there any more questions can i just share my screen for a second sure sure see this is the transposition flap i was talking about this pink part can everybody see yeah yeah if you can make a slide show yes sir yeah you make a slide show yes this this 
sink is the flap, like I was telling you, this is X, this is 1.5 X, it is lifted and it covers this area. Yes. See, this is a clinical case. Now, this flap was here, lifted, this is skin grafted, and the flap is used to cover. Just wanted to explain this. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Modi, for being here. My pleasure, and, sir. Uh, thank you for inviting oh, me. See you soon. And thank you very much, all friends. Dr. Thakur, Dr. Aditya, and all the participants, thank you. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you.